lives are dark and our hearts are broken Now is the time for your intervention There are no choices left, there is no option There is no hope left, you are the chosen Our souls are dying whilst we are still alive How can we go on? Can we now survive? We're waiting for that time when you will arrive So that religion and faith can be revived The world's become false Please come and make it true Oh Mahdi, we're waiting for you Tears are flowing They have lost everything Their fears are growing The world is standing by Though it is knowing The persecution That they are facing Wherever we look There is just bloodshed There is no love left Not even a shred of beating inside they are dead there's no sincerity the good are but a few oh Mahdi we're waiting for you Lost our way like a boat without a sail The smallest winds make this faith of our sway Our sins are countless, we're filled up with hate There is no honesty, no love to convey How can we so say... So to begin, I actually like to call our president and chairman uh, of the Aziz Duji for a reading from the Holy Quran. Thank you. Allah will be in the shaitan al-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wattin wa-zaytun Wattur-zinin Wahada al-balad al-amin لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم ثم رددناه أسفل سافلين إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فلهم أجر غير ممنون فما يكذبك بعد بالدين أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين صدق الله العلي العظيم Thank you. I was invited to Nibba Zeddy for the translation. My name is Nabba and I'll be doing the translation. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. By the fig and the olive and the Mount of Sinai and this city of security, we have indeed created man in the best of mold. Then do we abase him to be the lowest of the low, except such as believe and do righteous deeds, for they shall have a reward in failing. Then what can, after this, contradict them as to the judgment to come? Is not Allah and the wisest of judges? Surely Allah has revealed the truth. So what? Thank you very much. Uh, before we begin the seminar today, I would like to invite up our vice chairwoman, Fatima Sajjan, for a few words. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Our esteemed panel, my elders, brothers, and sisters, alaikum. Thank you for sharing your Sunday morning and afternoon with us, coming out and 
spending all this time with us. Hopefully it will be very fruitful. Um, why are we here today? Uh, we're here to discuss some of the heavy questions that have been with us, lurking with us for years while we've been in Canada. Not just to discuss, but we want change, and we're ready to make change. Um, to start, I'll just give you a couple of points uh, to open up um, our discussion. Canada is one of the only countries that has multiculturalism built into the Constitution. Yet, the Muslim community does not take advantage of this. According to an Angus Reid poll, more than 50% of Canadians dislike Islam. So what are we doing about this? People don't understand Islam. They don't understand Muslims. So we need to be out there showing our good character so that they do understand. When we say we want to get involved, what are the things that we're talking about? Many of you here are involved in various capacities. And to give you a couple examples that we can think about perhaps in the future, um, in the near future, would be to get involved in politics at all three levels. Get involved with politicians, their riding associations, volunteer outside your Muslim community, outside your Jamaat, places like the United Way, government agencies like the Ontario Human Rights Commission, um, various colleges. Eventually we get heard and we get represented. In Ontario, there are three Muslim MPPs, and at the federal level, there are none. Uh, the Sikh community is smaller than the Muslim community, yet they are far more involved in the political arena than we are. So these are a couple of things that we need to think about, where our priorities are, how are we ready to make change. Um, you have questions at your tables, and um, each of you will be assigned uh, one question. You may or may not feel comfortable answering that question or may not um, relate to you, but we would really, really encourage you to try to answer that question. If it doesn't apply to you, why doesn't it apply to you? If you don't like the question, why don't you like the question? These are things that are important for us to think about. You have a preview of the rest of the questions, so feel free to take notes on those questions. And if you feel your point has not been um, uh, expressed based on that question, then you're welcome to share your point as well. And let's see. I think that's it. So I'm going to pass it back to my colleague Zahid, and he's going to introduce our panel, and uh, we'll let the thought process start from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatima. Uh, before we open up the interactive session, I'd like to introduce our keynote, which is Brother Salim Sajadina. Salim Sajadina actually is one of the first um, first community members practically in Toronto. He immigrated in the 60s. And just to give that some context, they actually didn't open up immigration to visible minorities until 1961. So he was literally one, one of the first people from our community here in Canada. And he came from Idi Amin's Uganda, which is quite a historic um, story in itself. So I don't want to rob him too much if it's part of your presentation. But like he's uh, basically one of the, our more acclaimed entrepreneurs and businessmen in our community. And he's here to help us here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajdina. Well, we are used to Dr. Sajdina, and he's in Tehran right now. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Hassan Waji, uh, Aziz Devji, uh, OL members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Attitudes of people or a community are not developed and built overnight. And therefore, we must take a deeper look at the history of the community to decipher why people think the way they think and behave in a certain way. I thank the management of oil, and particularly Reza Hirchi and Aziz Devji, for having taken the leap of faith with me in our attempt to trigger a debate the first one in our community anywhere in the world on the issue of our settlement in our new country. The elephant in the room, to use that metaphor, and the issue will never go away. It's there. It's gigantic. It's getting bigger and bigger. And we have to deal with it head on. I was the first Koja Ishnachri to migrate to Canada when I set my foot here 47 years ago. 
the formal institutional history of our settlement in Canada is slightly over 40 years old. And in all those years, this issue has never been formally talked for a table for deliberation and among members of this community. We will not resolve this issue in one sitting, like today. However, we can succeed in making us all think about it. Perhaps over time, we will be able to change our attitude to enable us all to embrace our new country and be proud Canadians. Once again, Raza and Aziz, thank you for your opportunity, opportunity and thank you all for having taken this time to weigh in in the ensuing discussions on this important issue that has been neglected for many years. As of today, the cat is out of the bag. And I just have to tell you, Raza Hirji is attending a, a Hindu friend's funeral. So this is again a good example of what multiculturalism is all about on our individual level and we have to bring it to the community level. So he will be back after his, uh, his attempts there. Anyway, let me, without much ado, uh, begin with this presentation. So, should we be transient or rooted in this country? Let's deal with our heritage first. Our forefathers lived in East Africa for generations. Our early settlers were brought by the British to East Africa by, our, by, by the British uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. Our sense of nationalism did not exist. It was lacking when we arrived on the shores of East Africa. And the reason for that was that our land of India did not exist as one political unit immediately before the British colonized it. We were a conglomeration of small and larger states. We had Maharajas here and Nawabs there and little Sultans here and one Emperor here, but we did not have India as a country. We like to define ourselves as Gujarati, Punjabis, Bang uh, Bengalis, Madrasis, but never Indians. We did not even have a language that was common to all of us in India. English, paradoxically, was the language that was brought by the, col the colonizers and that was our mother tongue that we could all speak. A Gujarati could not speak with a Bengali unless both of them knew English. To add to all this, we were colonized. And when you are colonized, you lose the sense of what is yours nationally. Our settlement in East Africa. Throughout our settlement in East Africa, we had a transient attitude towards our new land. Because we really did not know how long we would be there. We were brought by the British. We had no sense of belonging. But we were content with our transitory state, status. And as time progressed, we found a place for ourselves. And it, it pleased our, our colonial masters, the British, and we went into the buffer zone. A zone where the colonial masters were on the pinnacle of the pyramid. We were somewhere in between and the masses, the indigenous people, were in the bottom. <clears throat> we loved it. We cherished our law. It's fantastic. You know, we want live. you leave us alone, we'll do our own things. So it allowed us to live among ourselves, and to build our communities and stay in, in Israel. But insularity has its consequences. You have to pay the price. 
we first build the mentality of a frog in a well, to whom the world beyond his well doesn't exist. It allows us to retain our cultural values for a longer time uh, because we retard uh, the natural process of enculturation by being insular. We were more Indians in East Africa than the Indians in India. That allows you to stay intact within yourself. We were content with a political social environment in East Africa with subtle apartheid imposed by the British. We were not, we saw nothing wrong in playing cricket with the white Gymkhana team, but never be invited to the all white Gymkhana clubhouse. We were content to play the role of middle management as far as we could go, but never the bosses. We never were the bosses. As long as our colonial masters let us be with ourselves, we really didn't care if we were treated as second class citizens. But things are never the same. They keep moving. And in the 60s, <coughs> that brought about the time of independence to the colonized people. One by one, most of the countries were col were, that were uh, colonized in the 18th and 19th century, and some of them even longer, uh, were given the independence. We, the Indians, were out of place. <coughs> in the political hierarchy because our masters changed. The new masters came, right? We inherited the new masters and we had to deal with that issue. But we still hung on to our insular life. But started to feel and know, realize that our power was eroding, both political and business-wise, commercial. When Islam spread around in the world within the first 200 years of its history, it always had the capacity to root itself in the prevailing host cultures, or the direct. That's why when you go to Southeast Asia, you hear the ushering to the prayer from the mosque by beating of the gong. That's why when you attend a Friday prayer in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, and I was there, you hear the tribal cry accompanying the azan. Today, when you travel the world, you see the marks of that past glory all over the world where Muslims have, have ruled and settled. In Southern Europe, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Indonesia, North, East and West Africa, Mongolia, etc., not to mention the Middle East, you see monuments of that glorious past. A reminder of the past that spread the world, but at the same time adapted by rooting itself in the host culture. Living in a new and strange environment breeds insecurity. Because we live our familiar past, we have come to a strange country with different culture, different political uh, structure, different value system, and it makes you uh, insecure because you don't know where your place is. <coughs> that promotes insularity. We turn inwards. 
I love Western movies. The cowboy movies are fantastic. It's very simplistic. There's a good guy and a bad guy, and the good guy always wins. Right? In the old days before the talkies came, there were silent movies. And the silent movies, they, the, the, the director made sure that you knew who the good guy was and who the bad guy was. So those guys were always, good guy wore a white hat and the bad guy wore a black hat. So you knew immediately the situation. Well, in those movies, some, some of them covered this wagon train going through from east to west where pioneers settled down in new countries. And what happens is this, when they are going on the journey, suddenly on the hills, you see an Indian smoke signal. That is a threat. Now we have a problem. Immediately, what do what the wagon train do? They, they form a circle. They go inwards, because that's the best way to protect. Similarly, when you are insecure, the same attitude takes place. You become insular. You want to go inside and fight against the world outside. It's a threat that you sometimes are real, other times it's just imagine. Away from the comfort and familiar environment of our homeland, we tend to hang on to our traditions more ardently than we would otherwise. And it's our human nature to survive. So our defense mechanism gets figured and we start to work to protect ourselves. As mentioned before, we try to hang on to our traditions. In Canada today, we are still stuck with some of the laws established by our earlier settlers from the British Isles and France. While back in Scotland, for example, those laws have evolved and undergone changes. Yet here we have the same laws that were brought by the early Scottish settlers. Things when you go away from your culture, you try to overprotect it. You got to keep it solid. That's a human nature. We prefer to live in a proverbial fishbowl due to lack of confidence in ourselves and our ability to face the new world. Canada offers a new deal with multiculturalism entrenched in its constitution. One of the few countries, if not the only one in the world, that is formally committed to protecting the rights of its minorities. But we have to convince ourselves that this indeed is the new order. We don't have to believe that we have an inferior status, a second class citizen, that we must be transient and ready to take our marching order to leave this country a la Idi Amin. We don't have to believe that. The world is our oyster. We have to believe that. Canada is one of the few countries that will take you on your face value. It is not shackled with colonial past like the British or other European colonizers have. <coughs> we have to break free of those imaginary shackles that we have imposed on ourselves as a result of our past. This man, Tariq Ibrazia, he took a band of 500 people in the early 8th century and he crossed from Africa or in the Strait of Gibraltar and landed in Spain. Precisely at Gibraltar. Gibraltar was named after him. The Arabic name was Jabal Tariq, Mountain of Tariq. Well, General Tariq made a first order. He told his, his crew 500 people, 250 or so soldiers, and 250 volunteers. First order of business, burn the ships. They burned the ships. Then he said to his soldiers, he said, you got a mountain ahead of you, an ocean behind you, where do you want to go? 
they chose the mountain, they conquered Europe, they ruled it for 700 years, more than 700 years. They did not, were not insular, although they were minorities in, in, the, in, 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 in their ruled uh, uh, environment, but they integrated, they became part of Europe. They were, some of them were the forefathers that paved the way of Europe from dark ages into the Renaissance. That's what we did. Canada has welcomed us with open arms. Come. Whenever Uganda members of the community join us in 1970s, we here, who were already established, were a small community of 50 people, including children, all told. Eh? Now you can imagine how, with a, such a small community, can we welcome <coughs> and help this influx of Uganda refugees to this community? <coughs> well, we got help from Ontario government, federal, municipal governments, other church groups and social groups. They all helped us. The Canadians welcomed us into their homes, places of worship, clubs and social institutions. They campaigned among other Canadians to donate clothes, household furniture, so that we have a good start in our new country. They helped us finding jobs, tended to our other requirements as settlers in the new land of Canada. In short, they befriended us. We could not ask for anything more. This country is our oyster. The limitations to our settlement in this country is only self-imposed by us on ourselves. You have to believe that. It is not enough that we become lawyers and other professionals in this country. It's not enough. It's only a beginning. We must aspire to become partners in those law firms because that's where the influencing power rests and the long-term policies are made. It is not enough that we pursue journalism as a career. We should aspire to owning media which shapes the way we think and behave. We can live in a fishbowl or we can integrate with the mainstream Canada and be part of the whole. Let's stop thinking of ourselves as we compare us with them. When we integrate, we become inseparable from the mainstream society. It's not us against them anymore, it's us. When we do that, we start playing roles as full partners in the social and political life of this country. Let's encourage our children to aspire to become to becoming prime ministers of this great country. The Canadian promise is entrenched, albeit on, on paper in our constitution. Is that? Are we going to test its validity and demand its delivery? Or are we going to settle for the crumbs? Let's not make the same mistake our forefathers did in East Africa. Burn those ships. We are not going back. 
we are here to stay. This is home. For all it takes is your home. <coughs> if you can only believe this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Sasadita. Um, just to give context, uh, the, the 50 members that were in the community in the early 70s, that's like less than there are today, right? So you look around the room, I mean, there's, we have more than 50 people here. So there's fewer people um, in that community in the early 70s. Um, so on that note, um, my president and chairman, Abdulaziz Duji, wants to make it, say a few words. Mr. Duji? Duji. Give up. <laughs> Salim, thank you. Thank you. Just a little, just uh, considering the discussions that Dr. Wanti has been sharing with us, the choice stems from he's been talking about standing in, on the bank and watching the tides go back. <coughs> the tide will come and the tide will go. But the thought process is behind today's seminar comes back being a transient individual. I remember the days when we moved from, I was born and right and raised in Zanzibar. And I was probably one of the first ones in Dubai back in 1971. And when we looked at, we had to ask the questions, where to from here? price we paid today in terms of the number of people that had moved and settled in Dubai, you couldn't get a citizenship. So we had to look for alternatives. We had to find a way. And I'll never forget this with the meeting that I had with uh, the Canadian immigration counselor, my wife and I in Cairo. He says, oh, you've got a lot do not leave your culture, do not leave your traditions. You're coming into a melting pot, but don't isolate yourself. Get involved, the Canadians can learn, and you can learn. And that is the real gist of it, is to look at and see how best can we integrate and involve ourselves. The act of transference, we're full of, and call it the spade of spade. You know, everybody is going into me, question that begs to be asked, it says, what am I doing to correct the situation? Which is really what this session is about. Now I'm looking at over here and seeing, we have a mix. I was hoping that I'd get a little more use in the process, but at the end of the day, whatever the deliberations that we go through here, the message has to be passed on. We have to relay it to the family members and take some corrective actions. We've stayed back. We have a choice, and we wonder all the time, what has happened, what is happening? The one that we are addressing here today is what will happen. And in the happenings to come, where am I making that possible? So with that, Celine, thank you very much. At this juncture, I want to ask, uh, if I may, what's name? From a global North American perspective, can you shed a few lights based on the discussions before we open the floor? <laughs> Thank you, Salim, and thank you, um, Abdul Aziz, for uh, those comments. Uh, not to forget Zayed with his wonderful energy that uh, he brings to us. Thank you. I'll be very, very brief. Um, we'll discuss this, you know, on the table. But everything that Salim has mentioned, or shall I say, almost everything, you know where I'm going. Now, almost everything that Salim has mentioned is applicable. Uh, at least in the North American perspective, in terms of us being part and parcel of the communities that we call you know, our homes. In the United States, too, 
no one can point a finger at me and say you are not an American, as one could have when I lived in Britain, to say, but you're not really British, you only have a British passport. So, from that perspective, I think the North American landscape presents us a number of opportunities that, inshallah, we will discuss. Uh, the question of engagement at every level, I don't think it's an option for us. Uh, I think we should be discussing to a degree to say, it's not an option, it's how are we going to do this? Uh, be it here, be it in uh, the United States. If we do not take our rightful place at the institutional table, as it were, within the think tanks, within the political circles, then we will continue to remain in our four walls lamenting at how Muslims are being treated by others. This process of othering, which was used by Edward Said in a very, very effective manner to say that we have been made the other, the decades have moved on and the process of us being called the other needs to change. Nobody from outside can change it for us. We have to change it ourselves. With that, I have a slight difference of perspective with what Salim has presented, so if I may. One I, um, comment that he made, to say that let us not repeat the mistakes that our forefathers made in East Africa. I have a slight variance to that. And I'll share this perspective because this is a conversation, this is a discussion uh, in terms of how we do this. And the subject will come up, one of the questions is, do we integrate, do we assimilate? And it's in that context I'd like to make this statement. Some of you may have heard me on this. Some of you may feel this is like a broken record. This goes round and round and round. But there were three communities that left the, the Indian subcontinent at the same time. There were Biharis, Shia Ethnashris, who left to go to the Caribbean. There were people, sailors from UP, from Lucknow and their surrounding areas, who left to go to Fiji. And there were the Kojas who left Gujarat to go to East Africa. Today, this was in the 1850s and around that, because of economic situation, because of the drought and a lot of trials and tribulations, some of them had a choice to say that either stay on land and die or go out venture in the sea and die, or make it. And that is where we were, 150 or so years ago. The Biharis have lost it all. They lost it all because they are not Shias. They don't know who they are. All they are left with is the Ashura procession that we call the Julus, which has turned into a Jose festival where you have a West Indian kind of carnival where you have drinking, dancing, singing, and all those things, which remains the one vestige and one remain of their sheaves. The people in Fiji at least retained their faith of La ilaha illallah, but they became Sunnis. And we have the Koja community, which thrived in Africa, albeit within perhaps, as Brother Salim mentions, within its insularities, its cocoons. Was that a mistake? Was that something that we can learn when we think in terms of integration versus assimilation. Where do we draw the line? How is it that we can have the best of both worlds where we are able to retain part of our culture, part of our faith, or all of our faith, and at the same time being North Americans and being Canadians? I think that is a challenge that's in front of us, especially as we nurture the next generations to see where are we going? I'm delighted that we are discussing these things 
at this level and selling like he puts it. I do not believe in the 30 years of my involvement in community affairs that we have an opportunity to discuss a subject of this nature to say are we transient or are we rooted. So it's a brilliant topic and hopefully we'll all be able to deliberate. But I believe that we need to have a level of balance uh, in terms of how we move forward as a community. Thank you for listening to me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, folks, so we're going to break off into our groups. So you guys look at your table around you. That is your group. Um, essentially, um, the, the question at your table is the one that's the number on the number that's on the side of your table. So table one will deal with question number one. Table two will deal with question number two. And also while you're discussing, thinking of bass or something. Can you want. we say that for you we're ready? We've lost perspective of all reality. The essence of life we fail to see. We're not content with succumb to our greed. Our faith is losing out. What shall we now do? Oh Mahdi, we're waiting for you. Before live lovers of Hussein unprecedented We're facing so much pain So many massacres from place to place The streets of Pakistan The roads of Bahrain The world is crying out for you to bring peace Avenge the genocide through your justice and rid this universe of evil and sin allow us to be the ones within your midst the world has lost love is hurtful and cruel oh Mahdi we're waiting for you To make Islam our life's foundation And how to ask Allah for salvation Such is your status, O oh holy soul You made Allah's love your only goal Oh my Imam Son of Muhammad, inside your veins flows the purest of blood. You came down from heaven like a rosebud and left your sand forever in this world. Your name will live on forever now, till death you'll be in our hearts we vow. Oh my mom. And on the 
chains flooded were your blood stains inside your heart were the scars of those pains of what you saw that day on the hard plane oh you were patience personified you thanked a lot though your hands were tied oh my mom Your mother's beheaded and in fear Your sister was treated so severe The blood was pouring down from her ear And yet you were so brave that you spoke And in that courtyard the world awoke Oh my A small grave, a resting place for Sakina to lay. A shroud was her shirt covered in blood stains. Till end of time, that is how she will stay. Until today, she's so far from home. The prison's so dark, and she's alone. Oh, my mom. Oh, my mom. Cause in your mind Sean kept on repeating The lashes you got in all the beating For all these feelings there is no healing Those memories always will be raw Of what you heard, felt and what you saw Oh my mom Remembering Kerbala, your heart bled Your 72 loved ones were all dead Hussein, your father, now lay beheaded And then the tents were burned to the ground Your feet were tied and your hands were bound Oh my, my Pretty much all of you informally And just let you know that I'm coming to each ambassador in the order of of your question. So one goes first, two goes second, three goes third. And basically take two or three minutes. Now I'm not gonna cut you off, I don't really want to do that. But like try and keep it to a couple minutes and we're gonna go through each question one by one. So I'm gonna read the first question. Number one, do you think Muslims are fully engaged in Canadian society? How? And if we don't have our ambassador up, please come to the podium if you could. Uh, I was not supposed to be here, but the ambassador ditched me, <laughs> saying that she has exams, but it was not true because she is daughter of Salim, and she didn't want to give hard time to Salim, so that's why she left. Uh, we had a deliberation, and we said that First of all, we have to identify why do we have to assimilate into the wider society. And what we found, and the other question is, why don't we assimilate into the wider society? And we came to the conclusion that one of the reasons is fear of losing our own values and our own culture. So. Because of this fear, we really don't want to uh, engage. And the other thing that she has written down here, it says that the sermons that uh, is being given in our mosque is very detrimental, and especially to the young people. And that's why the young people really do not come and participate in our congregation. Uh, so, 
what would be the solution? How can we engage ourselves in the wider society? And the first thing is we have to step out from our comfort zone. If we do that, then only we can really participate. Uh, the second thing is we've got to have uh, increase and meaningful engagement with our friends and not just acquaintances. The third thing is we have to be very open and not to pass any toxic remarks about other faiths. Now, that is one of the detrimental factors that sometimes we have we have been stereotyped uh, by the other uh, communities. Uh, the other thing is that we should have our representation in the government. Now, starting from the councillors, getting into the politics, get into the councillor, then step up and get into the provincial, then so on and so forth, and get into the federal politics. Now, the, the example that was given yesterday or day before, that <coughs> Sikh community, Ismaili community, and all the other communities, we migrated at the same time to Canada. But look at the progress that Ismailis and Sikhs have done. There are three federal, uh, three politicians in the federal level uh, represented by the Sikhs and we have none. So we really have to step two, to take two steps backward and say what is the reason, why we are not engaged in, in, in the politics. Uh, the other thing is that we have to, sorry, yeah. The other thing is that we have to get into the media and uh, like um, all the other um, communities are doing. And uh, the other thing, the last one is, uh, I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> well, I guess I, I've said enough, so I, I, can't, I can't really make a what she's written. Okay, so this is what we're sorry. Thank you very much. That was really excellent. Bear, like you just put on the spot just now. But this wasn't our assigned ambassador. You did a great job. Thank you. Uh, for our second question, can Muslims keep their faith, values, and identity in Canada? What are the problems and or solutions? And number two. Uh, here we are talking of three things. Faith, values, and identity. And can we keep them? in the Canadian society and what we discussed is that yes we can do it provided there are certain conditions one is that that we should have the fundamental respect for the law of the land as well as for the others and everybody we should treat everybody as human beings if we do that then we can practice our values uh, faith and identity we can we can have that now the thing about this, whether whether it's a Muslim or not, but any any faith group can really keep all these things together, because like Muslim, the, the Muslim religion is Islam religion is is is, is very very worst. I mean, it has got long history. It has got culture. It has got uh, uh, role models like the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, Mawlana Hussein. We have got really good role models for us to basically improve ourselves and improve our society. So, so Islam itself is, is, is not a problem. What the problem is, is like how um, Dr. Waji said that, you know, there are three societies who went away and one society completely lost it. The other society, you know, does very little and the third one in East Africa basically practiced their religion and kept with that. So what we want to, since we want to say that religion is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, that we should keep it, we should stick to it. So how do we, how do we cultivate it? How do we keep it as well as simply, uh, uh, have our, 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 our rights um, um, acknowledged? The way to do it is basically, we as 
as, as, as Muslims should be first of all ourselves practicing, practicing Muslims and secondly we should give our kids all the training and all the uh, fundamental values of a society so that they can basically prosper. <coughs> so in order to do that, what we have to do is uh, we have to, as I said, give strong values to our kids. We should have no fear for anything, like you know how because of fear we do not, we do not uh, get things done. Uh, we basically stick to, to ourselves and we should get away from this role of us against them. We are all us. Thank you. Thank you, table number two. Uh, as a quick reminder, just for Oil's archives, if we could keep your notes that you've made while you're at the table, uh, this is for the ambassadors mostly, that would be incredibly helpful for us. Uh, next question, table number three. Should Muslims integrate or assimilate? Table number three. So the unanimous consent on our table was um, integration. We all believed in it because it's supported by our constitution. Um, but how we define integration is accepting your values, accepting the values of others, and seeing really getting to uh, getting on a discussion table to see how we can pick the best out of both, uh, as opposed to assimilation, which is where you are you're losing your own uh, values and you're just trying to blend into the mainstream. Uh, the rest of that is all these good things that you have uh, developed from your community, from your society. Uh, and your culture, um, they can easily be lost, just as was pointed out in the case of Fiji and in the case of Caribbean. One of the uh, members on our table also pointed out uh, that we have these interfaith uh, dialogue um, reforms called Mosaic. There's very little community uh, involvement from our side. Uh, we see people from other communities come and attend these, but not much from within the community of us. So we should be uh, getting more involved with those. Thank you very much, table number three. Uh, on that note, Nick, question number four. How do you relate to non-Muslims, socially, economically? Discuss the challenges faced. Table number four. So we have the um, pleasure of being question number four. Um, and I just actually want to say uh, one thing, just a suggestion. Because um, people have been talking about the representation from the Muslim community. Um, there is one MP that is Muslim. There are two senators who are Muslim. There are two uh, MP, provincial MPPs who are with portfolio ministers who are actually from this community. Um, I just wanted to play. I just wanted to make that correction. Um, and there's two ambassadors for Canada. One is a Sunni and one is a Shia. So I think that's something really amazing too. Um, so we talked um, about uh, the challenges that the Muslim community face. So um, our table was discussing how we shouldn't shut, how there was a real uh, fear when um, people came to Canada originally that there was a lot of pocket bashing and people just didn't like Muslims and the statistic that was given before is concerning that 50% of Canadians don't like Muslims. But that continuum is changing. It's becoming from more fear to acceptance. Um, so some of the challenges that they faced were different customs, values, cultural, um, just practices, ways of doing things. So the solutions, and we really focus I think on the solution because we have a lot. We have to bring non-Muslims into daily life. Um, economically, um, our people who are graduating with university degrees, they're getting uh, higher paying jobs and higher status jobs. Um, and then two suggestions, which I really, really liked um, that our table had um, done, was to have icebreakers. So why don't you have icebreakers with other types of communities and get to know them and really um, bring them into the community? 
Thank you very much, table number four. Uh, table number five, is trust a factor in stopping you to engage with other Canadian communities? Table number five. So everybody started with so. So our question was, <laughs> is trust a factor in stopping you to engage with other Canadian communities? That question can also be put in another way. Um, the, the question can also be put in another way. Is trust a factor stopping other communities, Canadian communities, to engage with you? But trust is not the first thing that comes into play in human social intercourse. Nor is it like a light switch that can be turned on and off at your whim. Trust is something that is built over time. So what are the factors that build trust? Openness, willing to respect others and their beliefs, not wearing religion on your sleeves, uh, which can be a factor to discourage others from engaging with you, body language, your attitude as perhaps the sole bearer of the absolute truth, and so on and so forth. Frankly, our feeling is that the Canadian multicultural policy has encouraged ghettoization of communities and made us more insular and disengaging with other communities, although this may not have been the intention of the original promoters. Thank you. are dark and our hearts are broken now is the time for your intervention there are no choices left there is no option there is no hope left you are the chosen our souls are dying whilst we are still alive how can we go